I just spent the last like 20 minutes trying to take a thumbnail for this video. I feel like my face looks weird in all of them. I don't know what's going on. We're just, we're moving on. Hello folks, welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be doing a, a, a mini wrap up um, of five short spooky reads. These are five books that are all under 300 pages um, and they are all very suitable for spooky season which is coming very quickly upon us which I love and also I'm like am I going to actually have time to make a Halloween costume this year? I don't know. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. So we have The Sister Who Ate Her Brothers and Other Gruesome Tales by Jen Campbell, illustrated by Adam D'Souza. The graphic novel Monstrous Volume 1 Awakening by Marjorie Liu and, uh, and illustrated by Sana Takeda. Uh, the Marrow Thieves by Cherie Dimeline. The Ballad of Black Tom by Victor Laval. And lastly, Possibly my favorite cover art of all of these, even though these are all very interesting. Uh, Certain Dark Things by Sylvia Moreno-Garcia. All right, first off, uh, The Sister Who Ate Her Brothers by Jen Campbell. Jen Campbell is um, a disabled uh, British author and YouTuber. She has a, a very active YouTube channel. She does a lot of book reviews. She does a lot of disability advocacy. I find her very charming um, and her descriptions are lovely and make me interested in books that are like on the edges of my comfort zone. Anyway, she's an author um, and this is um, a book of fairy tales. So she's not like the original author of these works, but she has taken these fairy tales from around the world and written them in her own tone. Um, and then uh, with lovely illustrations by Adam D'Souza. And first off, can we just admire the physical object of this book that has this gold, gold foiling on it? Um, and of course the naked <laughs> cover has the same artwork. So if you did get this for a young person, um, you wouldn't necessarily have to worry about the uh, book jacket being destroyed. It has a little um, book Mark Ribbon. It has a little book plate on the inside saying this book belongs to. This would be a lovely gift. <laughs> um, should you find it suitable for a young person in your life. And then we have these lovely um, like soft color illustrations. Some of them are in black and white and some of them are color in here. Let's see. We have uh, stories from Korea, Ireland, Japan, Norway, Nigeria, Inuit, Egypt, Germany, Russia, El Salvador, South Africa, India, China, and Spain. Um, so as the title suggests, these are gruesome tales. If I don't know if you are of the generation, but like scary stories to tell in the dark, um, or like the original grim fairy tales, the original Hans Christian Andersen, where, um, you know, they're not, you know, these are fairly dark fairy tales, you know, the bad people get punished in gruesome ways, terrible things happen to some of these people, but it's also told, I, but I think Jen Campbell has really done a great job of preserving the, the simplicity of a fairy tale in terms of um, not dwelling on the gruesomeness and presenting it in a way that like is... <laughs> appropriate for younger readers. I feel like I, as, I don't know, like a seven or eight year old would have liked this, but I was also like a kid who liked creepy dark stories. I think you just really need to know your audience. I think in as, a, as an adult, I totally still um, appreciate these, especially because Jen Campbell has done a good job of like incorporating some um, diversity and inclusion in here, you know, like she, there's like a queer couple in here in one of the, the fairy tale stories. Uh, the last story in here features a princess who loses all of her hair and is actually happy with it. Um, Jen actually has alopecia, um, which is like a permanent hair loss condition. She's very mindful of disability representation. Um, there's a, a another story where like a girl like loses her hands before she gets thrown into the ocean. Um, but for the most part with these stories, um, you know, good, good prevails, bad gets, you know, the bad people get punished, the good people escape. Um, and there are little lessons in there. Like one of my little taglines in here from one of the stories is like, always be polite to ghosts. You never know when it'll pay off. 
I did really enjoy like The Man Who Hunted Children, which is a uh, kind of South African spin on the Hansel and Gretel uh, fairy tale. Um, and then the story that inspired Always Be Polite to Ghosts is The House That Was Filled With Ghosts, um, which is a story about um, a man who wins a wife by providing a big house but the reason he can afford the house is because it's filled with ghosts and as she lives there she um like invites the ghosts to sit for tea and like you know, like she's polite and hospitable to them and in a way she pacifies these ghosts that otherwise have been known to terrorize people but because she's like hospitable and nice to them then they act she actually is able to like live there in peace um yeah anyway um Lovely, lovely. Okay, then we have Monstrous, which is, has just abs, what, what was my term for this? It was horrifically ex exquisite, I think? Exquisitely unsettling. Yes. Um, and actually, we have another uh, disabled protagonist because our um, protagonist, let's see, what what's her name? Micah. Um, her name is Micah. She's actually um, missing an arm and often has a uh, prosthetic piece that she wears instead. Ah, occasionally we'll, we'll have these um, interludes that kind of give some backstory to the world. But in this world we have the race of the humans, um, the ancients, which are these like mystical animal, animal gods, um, the cats, which are like kind of these mystical, I mean, they look like cats, but they have like multiple tails and people usually mistrust them because they are spies. Um, but they're kind of like a race unto their own. We have the mysterious old gods and then we have arcanic half breeds, which I believe are a uh, children born of ancients and humans. And um, for a while, um, humans and ancients could not interbreed and then suddenly mixed blood children started being born and created a bunch of <laughs> contention. This story mostly focuses on like the humans and the, do they just call them the half breeds? I would, I would love to have a more polite word to refer to them. Let's call it like the humans and the arcanic empire. So in this, Oh, this is hard. It's hard to explain. There is so much setup in here. Um, very lovely, complex world. My my fantasy living brain is having a great time. There is a lot of contention between the humans and the arcanic world, um, and part of it is um, uh, there are like these witches in the humans called the Kumea, and they get some of their magic serum energy from the blood of um, arcanic <laughs> beings. So the book opens with a, um, a slave market, mostly of children, and I believe Micah is a teenager, being auctioned off to a bunch of humans for various unpleasant purposes. It pull, pulls no punches in telling you that this is um, a world where if you get captured by the opposing side, horrific things will happen. Um, and then a Kumeya witch comes in and interrupts this auction and claims all of the Arcanic children. Um, and then we kind of learn that Micah kind of, I believe, like, was it kind of infiltrated and was intentionally captured so she could infiltrate this Kumeya stronghold because she's trying to get answers about her mother, who I believe is one of the um, original Arcanic God. Yeah, I believe she was possibly one of the original ancients. I have a terrible, if you're new here, I have a terrible, terrible memory for details. Um, and I read really fast. And sometimes I read a lot of things on audiobooks, so I lose a lot of details. Sorry, but that's also how I roll. We're here to enjoy the books, not necessarily write a book report that's going to be graded. <laughs> um, so she's looking for answers about her mother, and in um, accessing the like head Kumeo witch in the stronghold, she um, 
finds a partial fragment of this mask that is like a remnant of one of the old gods and she kind of gets infected with this being that has like this symbol of the eye like it's a being of like many many eyes and these big tentacles so then she's escaping with that still trying to find answers about her mother dealing with this entity that is within her um and then when it becomes when um other authorities come to investigate the aftermath of the stronghold um they realize oh this person had this this artifact this mask and now there's another another faction that is looking for her tr basically trying to get access to this this ancient power um and then uh, micah is all if the title kind of com comes from she already had this kind of very terrifying power within her that she sometimes loses control over and like there's this hunger in her so she's really fighting that she's fighting with this new entity that's kind of possessing her um and that's kind of <laughs> what i remember of like the first installment of the story and i this is like a beautifully complex world um, I really look forward to seeing more of it. I'm definitely getting, like, uh, Castlevania vibes, if you are familiar with, um, mostly I, 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 I think I may have read some of the graphic novel, but I'm mostly familiar with, like, the fairly new animated show, which is very good. If you want, like, snarky, sexy, vampire, adult animation, anime show, um, Castlevania is great, um, and also very, like, good, good, interesting illustration um art style in there like the art style and this is very different but i feel like the complexity of the world like the various layers of magic of various people um various characters kind of uncovering lost knowledge i feel like there's not a lot of like distinct parallels it's just more of a vibe like if you really liked that show you might like this story and vice versa um and also um that show is can get like quite violent and like quite horrific you know it doesn't pull its punches with like the violence <laughs> um and also some of the like uh ethical monstrosity that characters are capable of committing and i feel like there are similar themes in this story so yeah um not for the faint of heart but fascinating next we've got uh, the Marrow Thieves by Cherie Demeline. Let's see. A whole bunch of awards on here. We've got 2018 Selection Canada Reads, GG Books winner, Canada Council for the Arts, Governor's General Literary Award, the Kirkus Prize winner, Amy Mathers Teen Book Award winner, Burt Award for First Nations, Inuit, and Métis Young Adult Literature 2018 winner. Um, so, get... As implied by the awards, this uh, is an indigenous author. Let's see. She's a Métis author. Um, so she's from um, Canada. Um, and this follows a group of mostly, mostly young um, North American indigenous um, kids with like one or two um, adults surviving in a potential future Canada. I kind of don't want to call it post-apocalyptic because it kind of pulls on the um the description, the analogy, the the argument that North American Indigenous people are already living in a post-apocalyptic world. Like if you think about um the atrocities that have been committed to them you know, from in, you know, because of uh, European colonization, like they are living in a post-apocalyptic world. You know, they lost their lands. There's massive wars, massive casualties, definitely an attempted genocide first by like for full out killing them. And then by like integrating and absorbing and diluting and disappearing them. And a lot of that stuff, like it's not, it's still continuing to this day just in less and less overt methods and winning legal cases, um, regaining any kind of sovereignty, re you know, um, regaining their language, regaining their ceremonial tra traditions. Um, like all of that is fought so hard in the face of circumstances that are kind of still trying to disappear them. So, okay, with that context, <laughs> 
what is the actual plot. So we are following um, uh, a young boy. Frenchie is kind of our main protagonist, but there's various other um, kids he meets along the way. This is a world where people have, st have lost the ability to dream, except for indigenous people. And um, the, the probably the one weak, weak point of this story is we get a little bit of description of like, why is the the impact of not being able to dream so, so um, horrible, so horrific? Like, why is the rest of society willing to do such horrible things in order to try and find a cure, to try and remedy this? Um, and like what caused it and we could get a little bit of, of theorizing about that but that's a part of you know that's kind of like a fantasy element of the world that's not heavily explored um, but also like that's not really what the story is about this is not a f about a fantasy world where people stop dreaming this is that is the context of um, the post-apocalyptic circumstances that the First Nations people are finding themselves in yet again. So um, at some point, you know, in giving the backstory, they talk about like, yeah, at first, the, the white people, the non-Indigenous people turned to Indigenous knowledge the way that like New Age spirituality did, where it's like, it's going to heal us, it's going to guide us. So let me just explain this little bit of thing, because like, can I, can I complete a coherent sentence? It's a flip of the coin every time. They asked for volunteers first, putting out ads asking for people with indigenous bloodlines and good general health to check with local clinics for medical trials. They'd give you room and board for a week and a small honor honorarium to pay for your time off work. By then, our distrust had grown stronger and they didn't get many volunteers from the public. So they turned to the prisons. The prisons were always full of our people, whether or not the prisoners went voluntarily, who knew? There weren't enough people worried about the well-being of prisoners to really make make sure. Um, and then from there, they flat out just start kidnapping <laughs> indigenous people um, because they have found, based on the title, the marrow thieves, that there's something in the bone marrow of the indigenous people that potentially holds a cure. It's not clear. That's again, like the thing that's kind of weak. It's like once they take the marrow, what do they do with it? Are they still, like, testing? Are they still experimenting? Or is the bone marrow actually a cure for putting dreams back into non-Indigenous people? Um, that was... I mean, I mostly listened to this on audiobook again, so maybe they do explain it and I kind of missed it. But that's also not the focus of the story. The focus of the story is um, these kids being chased and eventually one of their elders gets captured and they're like... She's one of the few people who is still fluent in this language. This is so important. She's... She's one of the few elders who are left and she is full of so much knowledge that she's valuable enough to risk going to get her back. Um, so that's part of the story. And then there's also um, Frenchie. There's a, there's a lot of like storytelling tradition in here and a lot of talking about like the dreams and the power of dreams. And um, oh, what was what was my little blurb about this one? dreaming of a better world is a powerful thing um that's kind of like the overarching theme of this where it's not just the literal dreaming while you sleep and you know the the hope and the knowledge that is preserved in that but in the face of such horrific circumstances the people who are not who are not just surviving but are surviving for the purpose of making tomorrow better even if it's a tomorrow that you will not live to see there is a lot of power in that yeah this is kind of one of those like genre genre blended stories where there's a lot of like horrific elements in here you could argue that it's kind of fantasy because it's post-apocalyptic but like I said like it's based on this um, perspective that the apocalypse is not a fantasy. It is a thing that has happened and is kind, in a way still happening and very easily could kind of regress again. Um, so it, I guess cautionary tale, cautionary tale, I think would be a blurb I would assign to this. Um, but it's also very much like a love letter to 
language and tradition and communal knowledge and yeah very interesting i have another book by sheree de on, on my shelves and i'm very excited to read more from her very thought-provoking then we've got this little dude uh the ballad of black tom by victor laval oh i like this blurb full of rage and passion um so while reading this let me tell you what it's about first come on honey you can do it so this is a story about Charles Thomas Tester, Charles Tommy Tester. Um, he is a hustler who, you know, he's a musician, but he's also a hustler. He does a little bit of busking, but he also kind of is like a, a, a burgeoning con man. He's a black man in turn of the century America. Um, you know, he's trying to meet and make ends meet. He's trying to provide for him and his father. Um, you know, he's trying to keep out of trouble, but he's also, like, not above bending the rules. The world's not doing him any, any favors. He doesn't really owe anyone good behavior. He's just trying to survive. Um, so this starts with he's, like, making a delivery to... Um, when he delivers an occult book to a reclusive sorceress in the heart of Queens, Queens, New York, uh, Tom opens the door to a deeper realm of magic and earns the attention of things best left sleeping. In that in kind of finding a loophole in the instructions that he was supposed to follow to deliver this book to this sorceress. Um, some paranormal things come after him and he gets swept up into this world where like re reality and nightmares kind of start to blend and he, um, over time, morphs into this spectral figure of Black Tom. Um, and, um, while I was reading this, I, oh, I was mostly listening to it on the audiobook again. Um, I was mostly thinking like, oh, I am getting very, um, oh, what's, what's, what is that author's name? I was getting, I was like, oh, I'm getting very Lovecraftian vibes. Is it shitty of me to compare this? black author story of a black man to H.P. Lovecraft, who is very well known for his racism of the time. And then I, I actually found, went, when I was going back to the physical book to put my, my tabs in, the dedication is for H.P. Lovecraft with all my conflicted feelings. So, okay, the comparison is apt and intentional. Um, cool great <laughs> good context um but yes we've definitely got the lovecraftian vibes which i haven't read a lot of him i, I would like to read more not because uh, more as a cultural reference to apply to more modern stories let's see what is lovecraftian about it um my little blurb was like move over move over cthulhu we've there's a new dark god in town so there are like these you know uh, Tommy Tester starts encountering like these paranormal figures and paranormal paranormal circumstances and they kind of just keep expanding and expanding there's another layer there's you know another figure behind this that's kind of you know living outside of normal human reality that's kind of pulling the strings in the world um, and then when I say that he he be, he manifests into the specter of Black Tom it's there's a lot in here about the experience and pain and trauma and rage the rage of being a black man in this time period and how much he has to keep that rage in check and with his paranormal experiences he kind of can now be the embodiment of the victim of that injustice and reach out and and wreck justice <laughs> on there's like a, a policeman and a, some other figures that he you know, with this paranormal influence, he can now be this, this, um, kind of vengeful, vengeful spirit, vengeful entity. I think what I found really intriguing, especially with like the, um, H.P. Lovecraft reference is, um, like I mentioned, like H.P. Lovecraft has, is known for a lot of really blatant racism in his writings that were, I don't want to say appropriate, it's not the right word, but like very much a pr unashamedly a product of his time. Um, 
but it's interesting to see someone take that style and be like, all right, let's twist this around and let's put the the experiences and the voice and the power into the hands of those who previously have kind of been turned off by those stories. Um, and I think that's, that, that is like a kind of fiction that like I find really exciting is, is, um, not just like people of color and people of marginalized, other marginalized identities, um, just like telling their own story, but also like telling their story in the tradition of a genre or a particular author or a particular um just something that has traditionally like not portrayed them in the best light and being like all right i'm gonna make a version of this that's for us now very atmospheric very thought-provoking also very good great Okay, and lastly, we have Certain Dark Things by Silvia Moreno-Garcia. This is a um, vampire noir story set in slightly futuristic Mexico City. There is so much about that description that I fucking love. What was my blurb for this? Fresh blood on, on an old genre. Because it, we've got, again, like I said, like it's a noir. Um and a vampire story but this is there's a lot about this that's again kind of kind of like Battle of the Black Tom taking like these genres that are oversaturated um with white storytellers and taking what's popular about those genres but then infusing it with something that like this author's own perspective could only fusing with something new that could only come from the perspective of someone of a very different demographic. We follow Domingo, who is a like 17 year old garbage collector. Um, and he, which is not like an official job. It's kind of like a, a, a street scavenger kid. And he um, stumbles across uh, a woman named Atal who is a vampire and she is a young vampire. She's actually only 21 years old, which is another thing that I, which is I think one of the first things that I think we don't see very much in vampire fiction. Like I have seen it before, but it's usually when we see vampires, they are hundreds if not thousands of years old. There are these, you know, immortal, knowledgeable, wise, powerful beings. And it's interesting to see someone who is young and knows that she has this long life ahead of her, but is young and is in a situation where she's very much feeling how inexperienced and unwise and unknowledgeable she is. Is unknowledgeable a word? Not yet having the knowledge of navigating the complex situation she has found herself in. Um, the depiction of vampires is interesting um, because we definitely have like the Latin American vampires, which are called um, Lawichpotli uh, is the word for them. Um, it's a, an Aztec word. And we have references to vampires from all over the world. Um, so we have vampires of different strengths and weaknesses. There's vampires who can go out into the sunlight and those who are, are kind of harmed by it. Like one of her abilities is she can kind of climb the wall, climb walls and ceilings like a lizard. Yeah, there's, there's vampires who feed on literal blood. There's vampires who feed on life energy. Like we see quite the variety of vampire folklore making its way in here. So in this somewhat future world, the vampires are technically, um, exiled and illegal from Mexico City. They're kind of... I, I'm, I'm struggling to kind of figure out what kind of parallel I can compare them to in modern, in like the real world. Maybe, I think there's, there's some... There's, I mean, there are some very blatant comparisons of them to um, the cartel and like large-scale organized crime mafia um, entities because they also are like drugs, you know, they also like manufacture and smuggle certain drugs and stuff. Um, but the fact that there's also this like e ethnic aspect to, um, 
humans' attitudes towards them. It's a, it's a very interesting take, especially um, from an author and with a heritage, the author's Mexican, um, with that coming from a region that has both um, like the criminal cartel um, aspects to contend with and then also a lot of like immigration border issues to contend with on both ends of the country. So I, I really like how she's kind of combined these two messy <laughs> major issues um, and is kind of exploring them through this this paranormal lens. And so let's see, so Domingo finds Atul, she is on the run from another vampire faction. Um, there was like, there's her family and this other family and, and there's, you know, uh, like mafia war between them. And she's like one of the last members of her family who's on the run. And she's trying, she, she's trying to get to Guatemala. How do they meet? Like she finds him on the train. She's kind of like entrancing him because of course she does need to drink blood and stuff, but she doesn't try to kill her victims. Um, so, you know, initially it's like he's food. <laughs> food and companionship um but then you know he kind of becomes infatuated with her and then she kind of like bonds herself to him and then he gets really involved in trying to help her try to leave the country you know it's interesting i was thinking about like the the noir aspect of this like that really comes into there is a female police officer who is trying to investigate some murders and um you know she's trying to convince her boss that there's like a vampire gang in town like we need to pay attention to this and her boss is like blowing her off um so she kind of goes rogue trying to investigate this stuff um and she she kind of uh follows the trail of atul um not really realizing that atul is mixed up in this other larger thing with this other vampire group um so that's an element of like the noir investigation aspect there's also like there's either like the ingenue who was like very sweet and lovable and vulnerable and needs saving, but there's also the femme fatale of the beautiful woman who is keeping secrets but is also in danger and is alluring. More powerful than the ingenue but also still like in danger and needs saving. And it's interesting how like that, those those archetypes are kind of playing out with Atul and Domingo. I actually get like Anjanu vibes with Domingo because he's like this vulnerable, very young human who's very infatuated with this like, you know, powerful, mythical vampire woman. Um, but there's moments where he is like trying to help her and, you know, his affection for her is like very genuine. Um, and she's also like, she's kind of like, like shaken up his world and he's, he's, um, yeah, I found like their their relationship arc to be to be very interesting. Um, and then she's, of course, like she she is both vulnerable and powerful, um, depending on the circumstances and depending on who she's facing. Um, and I think what's what's really interesting with their their relationship is I think there is a lot of like genuine affection in there. And Domingo is like very committed to like trying to make it work, and she's like. You know, there's a whole line in here of, like, vampires, you must never forget your hunger. The hunger will always win. So while she also has some genuine affection for Domingo, she also knows that, like, this isn't a fairy tale. There, There is no happy ending for them. Um, but he also, like, instills a lot of, like, hope in her that there are good people in the world who you know not everyone is just out to get you not everyone is backstabbing and self-serving um so yeah and also this is this is also just like a very like action-packed um urban fantasy there's so much i like about this <laughs> i mean of course vampires love it um aztec and mayan mythology love it um and then like interesting fleshed out characters action betrayal like kind of knowing that like some like things are gonna end up okay but how okay are they actually gonna end up and like how do we actually get there um so yeah i had a really good time with this so there we go those are five short spooky reads this is not a short video hopefully i will be able to shorten it a lot in editing let me know if uh you've read any of these, if you're planning to read any of these, if, if any of these have now caught your attention. Um, and yeah, 
great. If you just want to let me know you're here or if you've made it to the end of the video, um, leave me a key emoji. I hope you have a good rest of your day. I encourage you to go out into the world and be curious. I will have my social media and all the other places where you can find me in the description box below, along with like titles, authors, narrators, and everything for these books also in the description box. I will catch you folks in my next video. Bye!